Hi, I'm Dr. Angela Yakey. And I'm Dr. Kathleen O'Neill Smith. Welcome back to the Fire Em Up Doctors Good Medicine Doctor Series. We are so glad you joined us. We want to provide you with credible health resources, guide you in your treatment options, and fire you up to take control of your health. Kick COVID-19 to the curb. The go-to guide for fortifying your immune system and winning this germ war. By Drs. Angeli Mon Aiki and Kathleen O'Neill Smith, also known as the Fire em Up Doctors. They're easy to read primer provides the three essential ingredients for coping with our current health challenge. Information, analysis, and practical steps forward. Adding a cherry on top, they combine their work with online resources so that it never goes out of date. Brian Stanton, PhD, US Public Health Service, retired, and meeting PhD, JD. So like we have every week, um, that was our endorsement by Dr. Brian Stan, PhD, and Dr. Ann Muting, PhD, JD. Again, this is our guidebook, Kick COVID-19 to the Curb. Visit firemupdoctors.com to purchase the book. And we also are now available on Google Play. You can go to our website for more information, as well as to purchase the books. So last week, I guess, I think we had a little bit of a confusion. Um, I'm just letting you know that our NFIM hotline is still in place, the NFIM GMV as in Gators Make Victory at gmail.com. And then for any new questions that you may have for our webinars, you can go ahead and email firemupdoctors at gmail.com. And without further ado, I think it's time to get started. So I will go ahead and announce your firemup doctors. Dr. Angeli Mon Aiki and Dr. Kathleen O'Neill Smith. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Hi, Dr. Kathleen. How was your week? Ah, hello. Hello. It was good. Very, very good. Busy, but good. How about you? It was good. I, I just was realizing that this is the 14th Friday with this community. So thank you all for coming. Um, a lot of activity in Florida. We've had definitely we've definitely seen a spike. Some of it has been related to more testing, but people are going out now. And so uh, during this hour, I'd love to talk with you your thoughts on um, how to how to keep it contained uh, within your household, but also within the community, especially because Boston experienced it so much earlier than Florida. Yeah, we were there. Uh, we may end up back there, but we were there before, but now it's a little bit better, even with opening. So it's a lot better actually here. So it wasn't fun to go through it, but it's kind of, once you go through something, it's never as, you never fear, feel as anxious or fearful anymore because you've been through it. So yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. Yeah, so Emily, next slide. So we know when we started together in our community here in Florida, it was early March. And actually our first webinar was March 20th, but this is what United States looked like. And you were in the throes of it here in Boston back then um, on March 5th and uh, not so much in North Central Florida. Um, next slide. But here we are now where there's still a lot of red along the Eastern seaboard, a lot, a lot more in Florida. So, um, actually, we had our highest uh, today, 3,822 new cases um, in Florida today. And so um, we're going to have some good information, some discussion for our community. Again, emphasizing people, if you're at high risk, medium risk, or low risk, and, and what how to think about that. So basically, at least in Florida, we're starting to develop herd immunity or starting to have people who get infected, but that's nothing to be feared as long as you have good support and your immune system is fortified. 
So just today I got five messages that people had been exposed and what do you do about it? And so, yeah, I'm looking forward to further discussion with your experience from Boston. Well, I think this is so interesting because you can see how red it is in the Northeast and it's getting red. And, and one of the, I read a lot about this every day. I read extensively about this. So I think that the cold weather, and we anticipate that in October, November, December, when it's colder again in Boston, or as it gets colder, that there'll be another hit. But I think that in Florida, the delay was in the tra transmission of the virus. Initially, you know, it, you didn't have the weather for it. And now it's not the weather that's causing it. It's just the you know, that everybody's back outside, that there are more people and that people are feeling a little bit more laissez-faire because there is, you know, there's a fatigue around this. It's exhausting to be thinking about this. So um, we see it here, we see it there, but the gov governors of the Northeastern states, Connecticut, Boston, New Massachusetts, New York, et cetera, are all really, really conservative, um, primarily because they have had to uh, increase or double the number of hospital beds available at one point in time back in March and April. And uh, they got caught with, you know, blindfolded. So I think there's no real reason for anybody else to get caught blindfolded now that we are going out. But we also know a little bit more about what to do and how to, you know, kind of fortify immune systems and we don't have a drug, we don't have a treatment plan, we don't have a vaccine, we don't have any of those things at this point, but we certainly know a lot more about this bug and we understand that it's a blood vessel bu bug and not a lung disease. It's not a pulmonary bug primarily. So SARS, it's not SARS, it's different from SARS. And now that we understand some of the supportive measures that we can take, we're doing a better job. We also understand that one positive test result, particularly the PCRs we've talked about, is not sufficient to make a diagnosis of um, COVID-19. And that's really important. Yeah, and then that you wanna look at it from multiple angles. Um, also, one COVID-19 swab can miss 30% of people who are actually infected and that you might wanna consider either getting another swab or looking at a different testing method, I think. Um, so go with the symptoms, right? If the you have the most important, but the swab even could be positive, but not necessarily mean that you've got an infection actively or that you're going to infect anybody else. So I think that that's really important too. So both sides of it, it's extremely confusing and it's hard for non-medical people um, to understand that or non-mathematical people even, because it's, there can be a false positive rate and a false negative rate. We talk a lot about the false negative rate, but the false positive rate can exist as well when the prevalence is lower as we still all have a low prevalence here in the United States. That might be, this might be a good time to talk about what they're doing in North Central Florida because I want your opinion on it. So there's a patient of ours who lives in an outlying county whose um, health department went to the church and just swabbed everybody. And so her husband was positive and she's negative. She's completely asymptomatic, meaning no symptoms. Uh, her husband, um, in retrospect, earlier this week, was feeling muscle aches and tired, not feeling well, but he assumed it was because he just started going back to the gym. And so I, I heard about that today. I was just wondering what you would do in Boston uh, with that scenario? What would you do with that patient who's asymptomatic, whose husband tested COVID positive, who in retrospect was not feeling well earlier this week? Well, I, it's a little bit complicated. I hope you guys can hear me well now. I'm leaning in to the microphone. But first of all, a random test with a swab is tricky. So I would say that if the person who tested positive was working out, it's pretty unlikely. How old? How old roughly? Uh, fifth, mid fifties. Very unlikely that someone in their mid fifties is gonna be working out while they have COVID. I, I find that really hard to believe. Regardless of this, all this talk about asymptomatic, yada, yada. I think the asymptomatic is predominantly in young people. So um, I don't really buy that 
I think that's a little tricky. That's a tricky, I don't know. We don't have the answer. We have to, ex we have to lean into this and ask more questions and understand what the symptoms are. I would certainly have measured um, a CRP, a CBC with diff in the person who's testing positive and in the person who is negative, but you know, is concerned. Because you'd want to know there are other numbers that are going to change at the time of an acute infection. So remember with the PCR nasal swab test, there's two options. One could be that the bug is, that it's just a little portion of the bug and there's no infect infectivity. And then two is that it's a false positive. And three, the other part, it's a, it's a true positive. So if it's a true positive, it is what it is. I would say that the partner has been exposed and the partner um, would probably want to limit exposure in terms of uh, quarantine from that person. So, and quarantining, it would be based up how long to quarantine would be based upon symptoms of both people. But if the positive person has symptoms that are progressing with fever, with myalgias, not just with myalgias, but with fever, with myalgias, or with sweats, or with chills, or with a sore throat, or a cough, or a chest tightness, or you got to have a constellation, or inability to smell, or inability to taste. If these, if these symptoms progress, or a skin rash, then it's likely a true positive. Um, and I would definitely want to be quarantined to mitigate the, the possibility that you get really sick from it. And maybe you'll be able to develop antibodies without getting sick. But most people get sick and recover. And, you know, most of my patients, I do know, you know, several people who have died, most of my patients get sick and recover. So there's a small percentage that, that don't. I mean, it's possible that, but you've got to take every precaution you can in terms of sleep, stress management, zinc, vitamin C, omega-3, and those different types of things. And I think it's really important to quarantine at this point in time. And to quarantine the sick person, deliver food outside the door, they quarantine inside, and then you stay away, for sure. So great. So to be clear, you, what you were teaching was that if there's a low prevalence, that the incidence of false positives is higher you're going to have a higher risk yes. of false yes. positive. Yes. I guess what the trick was that he was kind of sicky earlier this week. So what I recommended the patient do was go ahead and get swabbed again. And I think um, that's going to be valuable. I, I really don't because the swab, I have a, a neighbor and she's next door. She's in the um, healthcare industry and she has been swabbed 10 times and they're positive, but she's been asymptomatic. And we talked, I think we talked about this last week. They changed the guidelines because the swab can be positive again. It's going to just create more confusion. The most important thing now, once you have a positive swab, will be what are the symptoms? And then the, the second most important thing will be measuring quantitative antibodies 14 days from the initial symptom. But the difficulty with this patient is that she happens to be a frontline healthcare worker. And so that's why I thought she should go to the health department and get swabbed again. So that's what she's doing. Well, why um, is what she's doing. By the time she goes back to the healthcare department, she'll be able to get a quantitative swab. I mean, a quantitative test. She's now how many days out? Well, she was, she was at church last Sunday and they just pan swabbed everybody. Hers was negative, his was positive. They just found out, like, I don't know what, what the delay was, but they just found out today she's asymptomatic still. And he then, if he was positive last Sunday, he's six days out. And so, so she's a healthcare worker frontline. So well, I don't think it's conscionable to send her back. No, she shouldn't um, go back right now. Until she I, either has antibodies or does a repeat, even if she's asymptomatic. So what I had her do was I had her go to our website and download the 14 day monitoring guide so that she could watch her vital signs and her temperature, et cetera. The most important thing is to A, find out whether he's a true positive and has antibodies. A nasal swab, so because we don't know if he was even infectious, his symptoms, 
and um, you know if he has a fever and if he's had chills or something else and he can't relate them or whatever it doesn't really matter the symptoms will be helpful but the most important thing will be to see if he's developed antibodies at the same time he's six days out so he has eight to ten more days and he you know it's the weekend now so he's going to meet have seven you know by by sunday it's eight days by monday it's nine days so there's one more week to wait and then do an antibody test on him and on her, because if she's, uh, if she's positive, she'll have an IgM. She'll be in the middle of it, or she'll be behind it, or she'll be nothing, in which case she, her nasal swab was possibly, not, not 100%, but, but was possibly true. A negative nasal swab was possibly true. If she doesn't have IgM, you know, I, I would think that she's fine, but I would certainly say that she stays home from her healthcare job this week and next week. Mm -hmm. And then does- yeah, That's and then probably does. the safest thing to do. Yeah, it's, I think it's the only thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's the responsible thing to do. Because one, you don't want her to be, you know, exposed to anybody new with anything. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe they have some other bug that they're exposing her to or with COVID secondarily, but you don't want her to be exposed to anything. Okay, so that's what we're doing for that patient. Okay, so then the other person I get, I got so many calls, like there's another one that um, is like a 30 year old whose trainer was not symptomatic, but got COVID swabbed and was positive. So basically, and we'll go through the risk. So there's low risk, medium and high risk, and we could talk about her in the context of risk. But there's been a lot of swabs and a lot of calls in North Florida. So yeah, let's go ahead and move on to the updates. And then we could go back to that in the context of our grid we're trying to teach. The swabs are tricky. You know, I mean, I think what they're doing in other countries, in China, in South Korea, in all the countries, when they swab, you're quarantined for 14 days and you're done. That's it. They don't necessarily go back and swab again. So bless you. What they're trying to do is mitigate in the event that you are positive, that you don't transmit it in that 14 day window. But what we would do here, in my opinion, would not be another swab, because you can't prove positive or negative through a swab, would be antibodies. And for antibodies, even IgM, you could measure the blood seven days out. Between seven and 14 days, you could find the IgM. But I still think it's better to look for both the IgM and the IgG 14 days out. Yeah, so thing? our point of care blood spot offers both. And when they're positive, then we do quantitative or at least try to. But that one can be negative. So I have a lot of patients who have been negative on that one. And then, I mean, this is a healthcare worker who needs to know quantitatively. The SD bioscience um, reports 97% sensitivity and specificity in 10 days. But again, it didn't report on prevalence. So you might be, you might be right in North Florida. All right, let's get to the updates. Next slide. So here it is in the US, we're 2.2 million confirmed. And in Florida, we've done a one and a half million. So we've done a lot more testing. I think at the health center in Gainesville, they did like 4,000 tests last week. Anybody going onto campus has to be tested whether or not they have symptoms. Um, in Florida, about 86,000 confirmed, 3,000 deaths. In Alachua County, we're doing a lot more testing. So our numbers look a little higher than last time. Uh, 600 cases confirmed, 11 deaths. In our community at North Florida Integrative Medicine, we've done 85 serology tests and three have been positive. Two IgG positivity that was uh, from patients who we knew had COVID and well, one had COVID who survived the hospital and the other was um, patient zero who had RSV. And I think this community knows about that person. And then one IgM positivity. So how are you doing in Massachusetts? Well, that's, I applaud you. That's like 5% uh, positivity in Florida or as a whole, right? So I think one and a half million tests, I'm assuming they're all nasal swabs. So hopefully that's true. And again, I think when you get confirmed positive from a nasal swab, it doesn't tell you about infectivity. 
So you're looking at 86,000 confirmed positive. You only know that there could be a part of a bug or a full bug there, and that's 5%. So 5% of the people tested, that's a big number testing, um, are, posit are confirmed positive with a swab. So that's interesting. I wish we were doing antibody testing because then we would know about protection. Um, that would be much more helpful. So, and the 12,000 hospitalized, you know, that's again, a percentage of, I don't know, I, I'm not gonna do the math that quick. If 86,000 of 1.5 is 5%, 12 is well under 2%. 2 so that's, I think that's what we can expect that less than 2% get hospitalized or even around one and a half percent. And the very, very few now um, in the ICU are fatal. So I think that's pretty good. In Boston, we don't have as many test results. I wonder if that's true, but I don't know. Uh, three quarters of a million um, with a lot more confirmed to be positive. So it looks like we have more prevalence, but I'm not really sure. I mean, I think it's, it's tricky with the testing results. If in Boston, I know that they're testing some people more than once, as you're suggesting, even for your healthcare worker. A lot of the healthcare workers, the one, my neighbor in my office has been tested at least 10 times. Is she, are her test results in here 10 times? That's the question. So the 741, does that reflect 10 tests in one person? I don't know, because I don't think anybody's clear about that. And are the confirmed positive results, if she had eight out of 10 positive results, even though she's asymptomatic now for six weeks, is she included in the confirmed every time? So that's a question. So I think the numbers can be misleading, um, but I do think, I know that we've had at least 70, 700 deaths, mostly in, um, mostly in uh, nursing homes. That's at least 50% of the deaths here. So, and it's pretty remarkable that just in one county, the Suffolk County, which is the whole, whole of downtown that we only have 900 deaths. I mean, any death is a problem, but uh, we do have a lot of nursing homes where people are quite sick. So that's good. I think that we're um, in Florida, we noted that about Massachusetts about the nursing home deaths. And so we're still locked down in the nursing homes. I'm taking care of spouses of people in assisted living and nursing homes. And they're quite frustrated that they can't go in to see their loved ones. But then we see the history of what happened in other states uh, when COVID gets into the nursing homes. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's really problematic. But the deaths in Florida are only 0.2%. I mean, that's a very, very good number. Yeah, so um, there, like with the uptick from this week, though, uh, the paper was reporting today that we're, we're showing a 7% positivity. So it's going up a little bit. I think it's because we've opened up and uh, we can talk about what that means in terms of who's starting to mobilize out the green people, the low risk people, hopefully are the ones. There you go. Okay, thank you. I really like this. And we talked about this last week that um, on the x axis, you have risk of deaths from COVID-19. So this has to do with your baseline risk, in your low, medium, or high. And in um, anyone on, who's listening, if you're not sure where you are, you, you can make a telehealth appointment with us and we would clarify that for you. But in general, it's a low risk people who actually are mobilized into the community. But we want a message that if you're low risk and you're mobilized in the community, that you be mindful of people who are medium risk, which are yellow, ye those in the yellow or red, high risk people. Those are 65 year olds with comorbid conditions or in our practice, the 306 patients who are part of Medicare's chronic care management program in our, in our office. Or a middle-aged person with a high risk condition, for example, if, um, if you're 50 years old with atrial fibrillation and history of heart attacks, I would tend to put you at a higher risk of, of of difficulty if you were to get COVID-19. So I think what we're seeing now is mobilization in Florida where the green people, the, the low risk people are now serving the community and actually potentially uh, getting infected, right? But I would put a shout out there because I've heard, you know, I do take care. We A lot of the people who serve our community are actually pre-medical. -med they're gonna go to med medical school next year or, or pre-PA, um, I've been talking to them and, and many of them say they're concerned about some of their peers who are not as mindful about higher risk people in their community. 
Um, and I think it's really, really important if you are in low risk um, category where you're out there working, et cetera, that you continue to wear a mask, that you wash your hands frequently, um, that you physically distance, because you don't know if that person in the grocery store uh, at Publix next to you is medium risk or high risk if they were to get COVID-19. I think so low and medium, let's talk about low risk. What constitutes low risk? Um, somebody asked, I saw in the question chat, their daughter has CMV, is she at higher risk? So I think the question that you would have if someone's young in their 20s, I have three 20 kids in their 20s, and they're all low risk. They're all very low risk. They don't have any medical problems. If you've had mono CMV, cytomegalovirus, CMV and mono are very similar. Herpes simplex virus is very similar. They're all herpes viruses. The question is, how is the virus that you've been exposed to and had before affecting you now? If you have outbreaks of herpes simplex one or two, if you have lassitude or I think they're outbreaks, exacerbations of mono or reactivation of mono where you don't feel well under stress or other things, then you should really be fortifying your immune system regardless of your age. And Anjali and I teach, Dr. Aiken and I teach about these things, about the risks that come with viruses. Generally, they should be low risk, but it all depends upon how you fortify your immune system. The better you fortify your immune system, if you've had mono or CMV or herpes one or herpes two depends upon your immune system. So that's easy enough to check by getting some very simple basic blood work. So I think that's important. If you have a, an autoimmune condition, a thyroiditis, an irritable, an inflammatory bowel disorder, anything like that, you're in medium risk regardless of your age. So if you already have an immune system that's confused with an autoimmune condition defined or undefined, I would say you're in medium risk category. Maybe because you're young on the low medium risk component, but you're in medium risk in my mind. Um, so low is relatively easy to determine low risk. High risk is relatively easy to determine. You're older 65, you've had heart disease, you've had diabetes, you have high blood pressure, you have a clotting problem, you have um, obesity, and you, have, and you feel inflamed. So those are easy enough to tell, that's high risk. And then medium risk, we talked about autoimmunity. Anybody with any autoimmunity would be in a medium risk. A lower age, if you're younger, 20s, early 30s, you'd be on the low end of the medium risk. The older you are, 50 or older, you're on the higher end of the medium risk group. So that's a general gestalt about how to look at low, medium, and high risk. So the low risk people, like my three children in their 20s, um, my son wanted to go out. He lives in San Francisco, typically. He's back in Boston since April or early May. He quarantined for 14 days when he came back, was alone, and then came home. I tested him, he had no antibodies. I didn't do a swab, he had no symptoms. So he hasn't had it. So since being home April and May, and now June, he's literally not seen any friends, you know, just by Zoom or other, but he just goes out to exercise, works, doesn't do anything. Last night, he wanted to meet a friend for dinner. In Boston, all the restaurants are done and closed by 8 p.m. We relatively have a curfew here. So he, I told him that, but he went out at eight and the restaurant was closed. So he came home. He didn't actually end up staying with his friend. They brought masks, you know, wash their hands. They, they're, that's what you have to do in Boston. And um, I think my kids are pretty good at doing that because they have family members who they would put at risk, who are in the high medium risk and the high risk category. So they're very mindful of that because they do have um, accountability and responsibility for the people that they love. That was a really good explanation. If there are questions about that, go ahead and put it in the chat. I, I see that there's a question next about taking the supplements with or without food. So um, yeah, I'll just go ahead and address that. So specifically, she was asking about vitamin C, vitamin D3 and zinc. So 
Uh, vitamin C can be taken with or without food. Vitamin D3 is a fat soluble vitamin. It's best taken with fatty food actually for absorption. Zinc is actually best taken without food, but some people don't tolerate zinc on an empty stomach. So that's how I would answer that question. Any comments on that, Dr. O'Neill Smith? They don't, you don't have to take them all together. Um, and you'll know if you don't feel well, but in general with my patients and taking supplements, sometimes it's hard to remember throughout the day. And even with the days turned upside down now because of less structure, I think it's really hard to remember. But if you take them all at once with food and that's easier for you, or without food, if it's easier for you. you um, I think a little bit of something, meaning a little bit of zinc is better than a lot of nothing if you forget to take it. So however, however you can remember to take it, especially if, it, if you don't feel well with it, taking it with food, I think that you'll, be, you'll still get some, I'm pretty sure. So to be clear, if you have to take it all together, C, D3, and zinc, you can. Zinc will be absorbed less, but it's better tolerated with food. Sure, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, while we're staying on this table, I do want to address um, the high risk uh, people in our community, which I've been messaging since, since early March to please shelter in. The goal of our practice is to keep you safe and well, at least until July 4th. I see July 4th is only a couple of weeks away. And I was just you know, trying to figure out what to tell you all because praise be to God, nobody, we haven't lost anybody. We almost lost one and we've had six COVID within our community. So when I was pondering this last night, I was thinking that based on this uptick, I would like the high risk people to continue to shelter in at this point, uh, even past July 4th and just keep coming to these webinars. Um, and I, I would like Dr. Kathleen's advice on that because it's getting tiring. I mean, seriously, this is the 14th week that some of the people have been coming to these town hall meetings. I so, think, yeah, our, it our is so exhausting. Well. It's exhausting. And I think um, we need to come up with a plan. And if there's, a, if you all have suggestions, all of you listening, I think we need a plan for some mental health support. I, I don't know what that is. And I've been, you know, pondering that with my, my team uh, here in Boston and trying to understand. So we were putting together some ideas for mental well-being and to do a webinar on that. But I think it's really important because it is getting very tiring. The one thing, so with the young and the low risk people going out, it's tricky. You know, one of the, one of the conversations that we've had is about their responsibility to the high risk people. I think there's a, a bi-directional responsibility, but we do want the young people to become infected because it's gonna increase the prevalence. It's gonna make the bug less virulent, right? It's not, if there are 10 people in a room and six young people already have the bug, it's gonna be harder to find the four people who don't have it. And it's going to, the bug's going to get tired too. Just like we're getting tired, the bug gets a little tired. It, it is, is virulent. That's not literal, that's figurative. So I think we do want that low risk population to be out. We just want that low risk population to understand that the high, we're trying to protect the high risk in the healthcare community. And we need them to help us protect them. So once they're, you know, 14 days after exposure, obviously longer is better, but 14 days minimum, then we think that they're gonna have less likelihood of infecting someone who's high risk. So I, I would hope that these green L's, the ones with the, the boxes with the L's in that, if we could get these people out and in the community, but we could shelter those M's and H's, the medium risk and the high risk, that would just be so wonderful. And you know, it's, it's a 14 day window. At, and like my son did, you know, and quarantined for 14 days, then he's pretty much at lower risk, particularly because anybody can be checked now. And I checked him way back when. Um, so I think for the high risk people, if there's a way for, for that we in the healthcare community can offer some support to them, 
I'd love to hear ideas from anybody listening. Um, we can, you know, have our young young staff members help and do programs. If I don't know what those programs would look like, I'm racking my brain. There's a lot of different things that I've done in positive psychology courses that I've done previously through University of Pennsylvania that maybe could be offered, but there's got to be ways to kind of, I don't know, do something less serious with them. Because <laughs> to end our week on Friday with stay home, you're not going to go out until after August now, it's just, it's not okay. I mean, we've got we've to think of how can we help you? That's a great idea, Dr. Kathleen, because I've been meeting with the high risk and me medium risk people as group medical visits for immune fortification now for a long time. But um, we, we would love to have you as a guest with your training in, in positive psychology on a group medical visit, because we've been really trying to keep them close to home, you know, really, really calling them and everything else to, to let them know that we're, we're looking out for them. But yes, it's getting tired, tiring. <laughs> I wonder though, I mean, so one of the things I think about is that for the high risk people, or certainly for the medium risk people, those two pink boxes, I think that is there a way, if they really are sequestered and quarantined, I think that they could be together. You know, the, the likelihood of community transmission, if those people really are, you know, they could, they could be together socially distanced or physically distanced with masks. Masks are important. I think I'm, I hate masks, but they're very, very important. They will add two layers of protection if both people in a room are wearing a mask. A third layer will be through the distance. A fourth layer could be the washing of the hands. But I certainly think that is there a way for them to have some social time? I don't know. Well, we would definitely love some ideas from our community. And, um, you know, I see in the chat that that it is true. We're in regards to mobilizing back to the workforce, if you're medium or high risk, some people don't have um, the option to go back due to finances. And it's really, really a hard situation, Dr. Kathleen. Mm -hmm. And those, those get individual conversations with us as well. Yeah, and I think for the people that have to go back to work that are at risk, I mean, I think that the only choice that they do have is to, you know, obviously the mask and the gloves, et cetera, but is to, um, is to do the immune fortification. It's really the only, and, and, and minimize stress because stress is the driver of 99.9% .9 of all disease. And so it's really, really important. Gentle exercise, yoga, qigong, walking, Take the appropriate immune fortification supplements we outline in our guidebook and not being stressed about it as best you can. Well, you, the, you can't change it. So I think that understanding to change the things that you can change and to let go of the things that you can't is, is, is hard to do, but it's important to practice. Great, great points. Next slide. Okay, so I had wanted to talk this week about uh, frequently asked question number 12, because I've had this frequently asked question, at least in Gainesville, um, about household transmission of the virus. Next slide. And so this is going back to the China data, um, that if one had COVID-19, that was called the secondary attack rate, that someone living in the house um, actually could get it 17% of the time, uh, but it seems less in children, actually. Uh, children's 4% and adults are 17%. So I misspoke, the overall attack rate is 16%, 16.3%. But it seems like children um, getting it from someone, a family member who's infected is actually less, it's 4%. But because of the closer contact of spouses, it goes up to 28.7%. If your spouse has it, you could have uh, a, a risk of getting it 28% uh, of the time. Now, the, the, there was a study in China that said 14 households were tested and they maintained a strict um, isolation within the home, meaning they put the sick person in a room, they brought them food, everybody in the house wore masks, and basically there was no transmission in, in those 14 households. And I know that number is low, but I think that there is 
with that, um, I think that would be a reason that if someone in your household were sick, that you should try the, the home quarantine. Any comments on that, Dr. Kathleen? Sure. I mean, I think that I, I really think it's the best solution. The home quarantine until they're symptom free um, is really important because otherwise it will go, it can go like wildfire. Um, so I think that quarantining is the best bet. It's not easy. All of my patients who have had COVID-19 have, the people who have died from COVID-19 are family members of my patients, but any of my patients who have had COVID-19 have been quarantined alone. So, and people have brought them food and people have brought them whatever they need and checked in on them regularly. So I think that the most amount of time, the average amount of time is um, 10 days that someone had to quarantine I do have one young woman in her 30s in New York who's been quarantined since April um, and she's just feeling exhausted. She's not continuing to be, have fevers or things like that, but she's just exhausted. So her energy level coming back, she just this week has started to go out and walk, but can't walk for very long. So she got a, a very severe case um, and she's new to me so I'm learning about her but generally she's well other than that so it just you don't know I think that with children the attack rate is generally very low and we hear about the, all of the cases of children typically that get sick or that are fatal and no child should die certainly but I think that usually those children have something underlying that was not realized so um yeah, and I think that we don't hear the whole story. So I don't know the situation there. But if this is true, even though it's a very small number, 14 households, if the, the transmission rate and people getting sick is 16%, that's really low. I think that's information about the virus that we need to explore a little bit more about. I think that's pretty good. I mean, we're looking for 50% prevalence in terms of in terms of herd immunity 16 percent within a community that's local in a house living together is pretty low um i don't i don't really know i think we need a little bit more of a general sop standard operating procedure to understand what all these numbers mean i agree next slide so you know in the paper it says some ways you could prevent household transmission is quarantine as dr kathleen said if you're feeling poorly, and you, I think this group knows all the symptoms at this point, um, especially even low-grade fever, 99, even though technically a fever in most papers are defined as a, a 100.4 Fahrenheit, even low-grade is concerning. Or if you've had a positive result, have all the family members use masks, um, dine separately, and uh, again, have them have their own room or their own suite and use household cleaning and disinfection, hand washing, um, disinfecting high touch surfaces like doorknobs, um, have them use their own toilet, uh, counters, et cetera. And then stay safe when using household disinfectants and cleaning products. There was a study that said about a third of Americans didn't know not to mix bleach with ammonia, for example. So the bottom line there is just whatever you're using, you, you wanna follow the instructions. And if you're not sure what to do, wear gloves because there was in that study, it said that some people are actually washing their skin, direct contact with unsafe um, disinfectants. So I think there's, there's some hope there that, uh, yeah, I agree 16% in secondary uh, attack rate is not that high. Yeah, I think it's not that high. I do think that, I mean, being quarantined is the same as dining separately and residing alone. Those sound so horrific when you when, when they're written that way. And in terms of all family members using a mask, I mean, I think that if someone's quarantined in a room and really, I think using a mask to go to that room and to, you know, have some interaction, at least through dropping off food or things like that, that's at least physically distant six or more feet apart, um, that's appropriate. And for the other members of the house, I, if you can tolerate masks, 
and you're not exposed to the person who's unwell, then use them. But otherwise, I think you still would want to with the other members of that community, because before that person got sick, they were transmitting it. So, you know, some people may never, never get sick and develop antibodies. I don't know what percentage of the population that is. Some people may get, I think most people get sick as far as we know, um, they get something, they get some symptom, whether it's just lack of smell or taste or whatever. Um, so I think the number one way that COVID-19 is transmitted is through respiratory droplets directly. So, or touching a, with a fresh respiratory droplet to your face. When people live alone, I would say that the majority of my patients, believe it or not, who got sick, live alone. And they just enlisted family, uh, friends, dear friends, because some of them don't have family here in Massachusetts, actually, or even in this country, but they had friends who dropped off food every day and they had interactions and they had multiple check-ins in a, a, a day with, I checked in with them and other people checked in with them throughout the day, but they mostly um, took Tylenol and they got through the day, you know, pretty readily. And uh, that's really the, it's, it's a long 10 days but it, if you know that you'll get through it and you know that 99.9% .9 of people get through it at home, then I think that that's encouraging. In terms of over 65, I don't think we have any data that de determines who goes to hospitals. I don't think that data exists and I wouldn't even wanna guess on that data um, because uh, I don't know. I mean, I think in terms of what we know about who goes to a hospital from the people who are sick, at this point in time, based on the data that I've reviewed within the last 10 days, it's 1% hospitalization. And well under, just like the numbers in Florida, it's 0.2%, 0.3% max of fatality. So it's a very, it's not a high number. Of course, any number is is we don't want due to COVID, but relative to, to other uh, causes of death, it's, it's small at this point. So, and that's really reassuring. So for the people on the call who belong to North Florida Integrative Medicine, we've managed everybody on telehealth except one patient number four who presented, who, who called us actually uh, at least a week into his illness. So he was already pretty advanced and he was, you know, it's older men who get really sick. And so he was actually hospitalized for two or three weeks and he's back out in the workforce. He was a healthcare worker or he is a healthcare worker. But for the rest of you, don't worry. You know, if you start getting sick, I'm on call this weekend. I could see you as early as seven o'clock tonight if you're sick, but just message in. And at the, the email Hotline still going on. It's nfimgmv at gmail.com. That's nfimgmv at gmail.com. And um, for especially you high risk people, the over 65s, I still have my COVID mobile active. I actually visited an older 83 year old person about last Friday because I didn't want him to go to the hospital. I did a home visit. So don't worry, we'll keep you close. If, if, some, if you start getting sick, um, most of the time we can manage you on telehealth. Even if you live at home, we'll check in live at home by yourself, we'll check in very frequently. We have a large team to support your care. So Heather wanted to know about newly infected people catching the disease most often. Is there a common space, place, or relationship that creates the most frequent transmission of COVID? I think it's usually, I think that what we understand is that there are super spreaders there's not a lot of them, but whoever they are, the reason we're trying to identify them through testing. However, um, they're asymptomatic when they're spreading and it's usually through direct exposure to something respiratory. That's my understanding. Yeah, and I think at least in Florida, it's, it's actually not as hot as it usually is in the summer, that if you, you want to see the ones that you love that you haven't seen, for example, my 80 year old mother down the street, I'm seeing her outside um, physically very distance intention, intentionally because she's in the high risk group. Um, outside would be a better place. What I'm also seeing locally though, are it's the healthcare workers that are 
<laughs> that are sick or getting sick or caring. And I think that's why at least the large institution in Gainesville, they're swabbing everybody for the most part. But that's beneficial, at least to get some, get a sense of what's happening in the in the community. The second step would be, and I would, if you are doing this and they're not, I would let people know that you can do the antibody testing. Yeah, so there's two things I wanted to announce to our people. The health departments readily do COVID swab testing for anybody who's interested. So we actually quit doing COVID swab testing. That's the Alachua County Health Department is offering it from 8 to 4.30 p.m. every single day. Union County Health Department also, it's walk-in basis, you just need to call. Putnam County Health Department, 8 to 345, Monday to Fridays, but locations change. So if the Alachua County Health Department is full, just call the outlying counties, even though you don't live there, they're willing to swab you. In addition, we offer point of care blood spot testing through SD Bioscience at 97% sensitivity and specificity reported for both IgM and IgG. In addition, on Monday and Wednesday, we actually draw blood and send it to your standard insurance-based lab as well. So you have opportunities to be tested. We will just screen you though, because we don't want our whole team to go down. If you're acutely sick, if you're acutely sick, the, the, the thing is to get a COVID swab not antibody testing. Right, if you have symptoms, you never go into a primary care office, you go to those testing sites. So I do see a question about a dog. Okay, so here's a question. There's a dog coming out, of, okay. Regarding a dog coming out of a house where the woman had contact with someone who tested positive. I'm picking up the dog next week and need to know how to protect myself. I guess the question is, is, could the dog be carrying COVID? So there was an FAQ in our book about a couple of cats early on um, from the CDC had reported a couple of cats having COVID and cats are similar to civets, which they think might've been an intermediary transmitter between the bat and the human in China. But at this point, the, 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 the risk of, of getting um, COVID from an animal, as far as I understand is very, very low. Have you read anything different? I have not read anything. I, I've read that it's very, very low. Extremely low. Yeah. If, if, yeah, we don't have any proof that that would happen. But I would just do the same things. I don't think that for any group, we can do what we can do. And again, that is the masks, the physical distance, the washing, the, um, the fortification of the immune system to create resilience. And I think that's, a, that's what we can do. The vitamin C, zinc, omega-3, D, all of those things. So again, there's a question about antibody testing. Yeah, so if you want us to, you can, you can go to Quest today, walk in and get antibody testing. Um, at our office, we're offering it, I, I wanted to correct that, we're offering the blood draws on Wednesday. You can get point of care testing if we arrange it beforehand mostly any day, but definitely we, we're trying to concentrate the point of care blood spot 15 minute testing to Friday morning. So we do a bunch in a row. We had an exposure last Friday. So I wanted to do those outside again. So you, the people who have antibody testing who come to our practice, they should be well, but this particular person had IgM positivity without IgG positivity which resulted in, in five of us being quarantined this week. So we're going to go, we're going to start doing those outside again. That will the, be hotline, the hotline's monitored very closely, nfimgmv at gmail.com. Just email your query and you'll be answered even this weekend. If it's about you, if it's about your particular situation or your, your, um, your own question. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be helpful too, if you all have specific questions, uh, we're happy to, continue along and, and talk about things that are important and clarify the information that's coming out. But if there are specific things that you're hearing, you know, and it's over the weekend after a Friday session and you want to email us a topic that you think warrants in, you know, being educated on, we're happy to do that. Send us the, send us information that you're yeah. hearing. At that email, it's just uh, Dr. Kathleen and I are, are trying to educate the public and through our 
through not only our guidebook, which by the way is available on Google Play for anyone around the world, all your friends and family, but through these types of teaching seminars. So feel free to share this. This is actually on Facebook Live and it will, and actually we've archived all of them on our website, firemupdoctors.com. So all those uh, texts and emails and calls I got today of friends of friends in Florida who have been exposed, I just referred them to the website. So we would be more than happy to answer your questions. But if it's a personal individualized questions, we have a team of five healthcare professionals who are totally available to do telehealth um, visits with you all, at least in our community. And like I said, I, I'm happy to do them as early as seven o'clock tonight. So um, I hope that's helpful. And uh, yeah, if there's nothing else, Emily, I'm gonna go ahead and sign off. I have another obligation in five minutes. Yes, of course. Um, we had a few more questions, but we don't have enough time today. So I told everyone to send us an email again at nfimgmb at gmail.com or the firemupdoctors at gmail.com. And we will go ahead and try and get back to you as quickly as possible. Well, thank you all. You guys be safe, be well, and God bless you all. And thank you, Dr. Kathleen. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Aiken and Dr. Kathleen. All right, before we finish off today, um, last week we mentioned the Workplace Safety Masterclass, which did start this past Tuesday. But if you would like to still enroll, if you are an NFIM patient, you can go ahead and email that hotline again at nfimgmb at gmail.com and just say that you would like to enroll and Dr. Iki will send all of the information. If you are not a patient, but you would still like to enroll, you can go ahead and email firemupdoctors at gmail.com. And again, she will go ahead, get that information to you and you'll be added to the class. The only thing is you will have missed last Tuesday's class, but besides that, um, you'll be able to start just like everyone else. Once again, um, this is our guidebook, Kick COVID-19 to the Curb. Most of you know that we're doing a June special. If you go ahead and buy our purchase, our paperback guidebook, from either the website or through email or a phone call, you can get 20% off the following supplements, ultra potent vitamin C, zinc AG, Numedica Immuno PRP spray and Olive Defense for the rest of June. Um, this is for our patients, but if you would like to become a new patient and take advantage of this deal, you can go ahead and email firemupdoctors at gmail.com. Once again, our ebook is 29, oh, sorry, our paperback book is $29.99, can be purchased through the website, can be purchased through our email, or can be purchased through a phone call. And our ebook is now available on Google. You can find the link to that by going to our website and it'll be on the very front page. You'll be able to see a little button that will lead you directly to purchase that. And that is all that we have for this Friday. Again, if we didn't get to your questions or you would like other questions answered, don't hesitate to email us and we will get back to you as soon as we can. Everyone have a great weekend. We're so glad you joined us today. We hope we've given you the tools to take control of your health. For more good medicine and information about any treatments, supplements, and resources discussed today, please visit us at www.firemupdoctors.com. That's F-I-R-R-I-M up doctors.com. And wherever you're listening from, remember to like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube and podcast channels so you don't miss out. The information provided is not a substitute for professional medical advice. This should not be used to diagnose, treat, or manage health problems without consultation. If you do experience any of the symptoms discussed today, please contact your nearest healthcare professional.